several chords in it, a couple of minor chords and all that. And he'd figure. And out. my brother would always figure those out and tell us what chords mm -hmm. to use. But along with that, right after getting the guitar, we of course we all wanted to play, so we ended up getting a mandolin. Oh. And eventually, my youngest brother got a banjo, and so we just kept adding what instruments we could come up with. <laughs> and so was that like in the evenings, that would be a fun thing to do? or Every evening. Oh, yeah. Probably not Sunday evening because we spent most of the day. We did go to church morning and night, and we would uh, on Sunday, and we'd have company. And also Sunday we didn't. But the other days it was, and then we had a, had a radio. And we oh. could get uh, we could get the Grand Ole Opry and the Old Dominion Barn Dance. It came out of Kentucky there, hmm. and the Grand Ole Opry out of Nashville. So we'd listen on Saturday nights to to the radio, and then when a new song would uh, come out, we'd try to learn it. And uh, so Violet was the one who always wrote the words down for us. She could hear the song, and when it was through, she she could write it out. Write out the lyrics. She had just a very good memory for that. And I remember one time a song Geddes and I had heard, and we wanted to get the words, and it came on. Violet was reading a book. We said, Violet, Violet, put your book down. <laughs> write the words down. She said, oh, I'm, I'm not. not we, she wouldn't, wasn't interested. So she kept uh, looking at her book, and we were so upset with her. And about 15 minutes later, she said, okay, get me a pencil and paper. She wrote down all the words. She had, she had been listening. <laughs> she just was giving us a hard yeah, yeah, time. Yeah, yeah. But oh. she was had her book there, but she wasn't reading during that song. She was memorizing the words. words. Okay. 15 <laughs> minutes later, wrote them oh. down for us. And then later, you all got pretty good, right? Well, we, we did, but I guess because I think the Lord had given us some talent and uh, all of us had a good ear Geddes could if he heard a heard a car horn he could tell you what note it was or <laughs> or somebody sing a note and i could usually do it mm -hmm. somebody being on the side of a glass and i'd say that's a that's a that's an e flat you know mm -hmm. or whatever i can't do that now uh -huh. i've lost a lot of my hearing but i used to be able to huh. Huh. and that's one thing that sort of made me want to tune pianos because because my sister got a piano and I could tell when it was out of tune oh, okay. and it just really bothered me. Okay. So. And so through the years, you've you've uh, probably tuned thousands of pianos, right? I guess I have, uh -huh. yes. He taught me how to piano. tune when I was, what was a senior in high school or whatever, right. about to come over to college. Somewhere in there, yeah. And then I tuned you, pianos for You were thinking about a, a job where you could work your way through college. Yeah. And uh -huh. I suggested you, you to learn to tune piano. Well, I tuned a bunch of them over seven or eight years. And so you probably 10 times more than me or, or, or may, way more than that, probably. Yeah. yeah. Wow, that's amazing. Uh -huh. Yeah, because you even to this day, you still do some tuning. Okay, so as far as music, that's, uh, you. well, you got later got into brass instruments too, right? That was when I went to college. Okay. I was, when I went to university and started hearing all the brass, I was fascinating. Oh, okay with that and uh, oh I first signed up took a semester of trumpet but uh -huh. it seemed that uh, I had uh, had some dental work done later but it seemed I just couldn't get the good tone on trumpet I switched to trombone and uh -huh. spent that. more time working with trombone than I did trumpet mm -hmm. so um let's see okay well that's uh and you've used music down the, through the years well Oof. I, my sister, my oldest sister, graduated from high school, and she got a job then and and bought a piano, mm -hmm. and she was still living at home, and so it was one of the self player pianos that had rolls in it. Oh, really? And you could listen to it. So, <laughs> so we listened to those, and I started trying to learn uh, those songs that they played there and doing it by ear. Mm -hmm. So I. I really was the only one that got interested in piano. learning to play piano. Mm -hmm. And like I say, we didn't have a music program at school, so I learned to play by, by ear, but oh. not really. I didn't study you know, until I, when I got in college. That's where you started. There was, a, we, there was a piano teacher that lived in their town, but uh, my family was very poor, and she charged 
quite a bit. So I think I studied one year with her, a little bit more than a year, mm -hmm. just enough to, I think I learned to treble cliff in the mm -hmm. lines of the spaces, yeah. but I still did everything by year, mm -hmm. most of it. Okay. Uh, tell me, tell us about the, uh, you mentioned food rations in one of our. Well, that came with the, uh, with the second world war. Uh -huh. Um, see, I was, uh, born in 34. So in 41, when I was seven years old, you know, the second world war, then they, then, uh, there was an amazing patriotism in the States during the, that second world war. And, uh, it, the military needed, uh, needed all the supplies. So, so the government started rationing. Uh, different things. You, we had food stamps, uh, and our family, according to the number in the family, you were allotted so many stamps for sugar was rationed, for example, milk. So, uh, so there were, that wasn't, I mean, you, you didn't need money. Well, yeah, we had buy it, but you could only buy it regardless of how much money you had. I see. We could only buy, let's so say much. two pounds mm. of sugar oh, okay. or, oh, okay. or whatever. And, uh, then, uh, milk just uh, just wasn't available. They is unless you had your own cow, right? But uh, we could get powdered milk, oh, yeah, and uh, mix it with water. And we we drank a lot of powdered milk during really? the war. We didn't have money for a cow at times, and uh -huh. so huh. we'd drink powdered milk. Yeah, I had that and powdered milk. Yes, it was rationed, even oh, really? living uh, uh, out in the country. Uh, if you had a tractor, you could get more stamps for uh, to get gasoline for tractors. Wow. Uh, I don't think there were many diesel tractors in those days. Everything mm. nearly was gas. Really? Or ours with kerosene, John oh, yeah. Deere. Uh, we eventually got a John Deere and it ran on kerosene. Huh. Had a small one gallon tank of gas for starting, starting it. it. Yeah, okay. And, and then, then as soon as kerosene. the motor warmed up, you switched to kerosene. Huh. Huh. So, wow, that's crazy. Uh, okay, tell us about what you remember in terms of churches and you, where was the church that y'all went to? How far was it? Well, uh, we lived two miles away from the closest church, which was uh, Sandy Run Baptist Church. And uh, But my granddad was a circuit riding preacher. And uh, over in the South Carolina, over in South Carolina, practically, well, it was really 25 miles from our home. But uh, my mother especially really pushed for us to, to attend there because her dad had started the church. And I know that uh, different times my dad was a deacon in that church. So when we could afford to, we would go to the church over in Chesney, South Carolina. Oh, wow. But when we didn't have a car, couldn't go, then, then I would go to Sandy Run. Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes walking, many times walking to church, mm -hmm. but it was just two miles. And, Gosh, you know. <laughs> and, uh, right. So <laughs> that's a good walk nowadays. Yeah. Um, did you have what did they have? Special meetings? They have a choir? They have evangelistic campaigns? What? what how are the churches? Or was it just well, the, a yes, simple week? Uh, well, okay, the church in our town. I can tell you more about it. It uh, they had a revival meeting every year. Mm -hmm. They would all. For we called it a revival meeting. It really was uh, evangelistic Evangel, yeah. to, to reach people. Mm -hmm. And then they would have Bible studies at time. When I was a senior in high school, um, I went to a five-week, a five-day uh, study the, each night on the Baptist distinctives. Okay. And I remember Dr. Morissette was a professor at uh, Gardner-Webb College, okay. which is just four miles that. from from my home. In fact, that's where Dwight Reed graduated from Gardner Webb. Okay. But uh, he was teaching about the Baptist distinctives. I was a senior in high school, a young convert. I'd gotten saved just right near the end of my junior year in high school. And one day in teaching, he mentioned that, that modernist preachers are sending people to hell. And uh, he mentioned, uh, uh, Harry Emerson Fosdick and York. you know so I just at that time it made a big impression on me and so uh, my my high school English teacher 
worked in uh, New York City in the summer, and he was going to that Colgate uh, church or whatever where yeah. Fosick was yeah, pastor. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I told him, I said, uh, Mr. Green, I heard that uh, modernist preachers are sending people to hell and that you, the pastor of that church, you go as a modernist. <laughs> He said, well, that's Dr. Marset's opinion. He said, but now Dr. Dyer is on their faculty, and he has a great respect for Fostick. So I thought, okay, that school, I don't want to go to it then because mm -hmm. they've got somebody that backs uh, modern <laughs> preachers. In fact, people just mm -hmm. figured I would go there. It was four miles from home. I could have lived at home. It had been very inexpensive. And But, mm -hmm. uh, but that, that, those conversations... Uh leaned you away from it. Yes, yeah. absolutely. Huh. Okay. Uh, okay, why don't we uh, mention a little bit about that corn grinder that you just saw. And you okay, said, well, hey, my... I put up a video. That yeah, he... my granddad was a, was a blacksmith, had a blacksmith shop. And I... He passed away when I was about nine years old, I think. But I do remember... In fact, I looked that up. I think it was about seven. But anyway, I... Uh, I still remember the the blacksmith shop. I remember one time watching him use this big bellus to uh, heat the coals and get them red out. And he was putting horseshoes into the in and get they'd get them red hot. Then he would take tongs and bend them, shape them just the way he wanted right, because right. he was the farrier, I guess you would call him, mm -hmm. in our community. Mm -hmm. And Please. my dad could also shoe horses or mules and do anything nearly that because he had grown up helping his granddad and huh. uh, his in dad black, in the, in the shop because he was the youngest of the boys. Mm -hmm. And so, he, in fact, he, my granddad was one of the first people in our community to buy a car. He bought a, a Model T Ford, T model we called him, <laughs> and he was trying to learn to drive it. He, My dad was the youngest in the family and the rest had married off when my granddad bought that Ford and uh, he was trying to learn to drive it. He always called my dad baby because he was the youngest. And one day he was trying to drive it and he ran it into the fence and uh, <laughs> got tangled up in the barbed wire. He finally got out, left the car saying, he said, okay, baby, it's yours. And he gave that car to my really? dad. He didn't want it anymore. He, he wasn't going to try to learn it anymore. <laughs> Because so he was way up in years then because uh, my dad was the youngest one of the and children. That, that ran on gas, obviously. Yeah. And it right. started like with a... With a crank. Crank. Yeah. I never got to drive a Model T Ford. Really? So I don't know. Did you? But, uh -huh. Wow. Yeah, that's, that's So back to the corn time. grinder thing because I'm going to show Okay, that so he had tools in his shop. Well, my brother-in-law uh, realized... to. Uh, my oldest sister's husband, that someday we would appreciate some of those things. So he saved a couple of tools out of there. He saved a corn grinder and a corn sheller. You put the ear of corn in and turn the thing and it shells, takes the, really? the grain off of the leaves, just the cob, you know, <laughs> gets off. And then you take it out there and put it in a grinder and you can grind it. And uh, if you leave it on the rough position, then it'll crack the corn, grind it up enough like to feed to the chickens. Okay. And or if you set it to finer, you can grind it enough to for cornmeal, you for know, your supper and make the cornbread. <laughs> so uh, my brother-in-law uh, saved those, and I ended up with those two things. Okay. The corn sheller I passed along to to my other son-in-law to Bru Drew Martin, you know, because uh -huh. he's out on the farm, and then the corn grinder. I took to uh, to one of Margaret's nephews, Joe Singletary, and that's where it is. And that's, that's where, where it is now, down in, in outside of Dothan, Alabama. They really, and he's using it. They have he lives on the farm, and they have chickens. So he takes that that 150 year old corn grinder or more. Hmm. It's probably 175 years old, Good, nice. and he grinds the corn. And uh, feeds it to his chickens. chickens. Yeah. That's crazy. When I went down this last time, he had a sack of corn he had ground up. Uh -huh. So uh -huh. he had to read. That's amazing. Those things still work. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Just hold it on there. You don't have to push anything. And that's doing a video of it grinding. So I'm grinding corn with, 
but the grinder came out of Grandpa Allen's blacksmith shop. Joe's got the video going here, and uh, then he grinds his corn up, and we feed it to, to his chickens. And I think that would do the trick. Well, when you get it all out, you can stick your finger down in there, and you can see it, it would it would it would be hard, I think, for it to get your finger. Yeah. Okay. I see. You'd have to go all the way down in there. Yes, sir. And yeah, well, I think we got it all. Okay. Uh, I have here something about the cars. Well, you mentioned the cars a little bit, and Bronner Bronner had a special talent. Oh. Right? No, uh, Bronner just had an. It, tremendous imagination and he was very handy with his hands he could he could build anything you know he he did a lot of things for us and so one day he decided to build us a car that we could enjoy for Giddis and and Alton and me you know the younger brothers and so he built uh, he just started with the scraps he could find there and the wheels he I don't know where he got all the wheels but he built uh, uh, let we call it was like a little go-kart uh -huh. But uh, it had such a strange shape that we called it a, ended up calling it a hunky dunky. But it, it had brakes on it. It had actually just a stick that you could hand brake. You uh -huh. pull it up yeah. and drag it on the ground and sure. stop it that way. And he put a steering wheel on it, and he he used a rope to do the winding on the the steering wheel and get it to the wheels, and. Uh, then just he told us you know, now if you want to have some fun he said here's the way you rewind it do it the opposite and when you turn the wheel to the right the car will go to the left <laughs> well we had a couple of hills in our pasture that we like to go down and so we would invite the neighbors over so, at times and we'd <laughs> rewind it and say hey why don't you take a ride down, down the hill and watch them uh, start to <laughs> go around a stump and turn the wheel and go right into it or go the other way. So we had a lot of fun with so, the hunky donkey. So maybe this imagination thing I have here was Bronner's imagination. That was Bronner. Okay. He was how interesting. Uh yeah, I have here first T V. Well, we we never had a TV when I was home because I, they were invented in the late forties there. Oh, okay. Uh but I went to but we didn't we couldn't afford one. And uh, I went off first to college, time but one? my dad got a TV, and it was just a, a little one that sits on some table or something, black and white for yeah. many, many years. You know, the yeah. color didn't come out for several years. They're big, right? Uh, yeah. Big things. Uh -huh. So what would they what would they show? Or Well, uh, I... Cartoons? I really, you know, I never series. really got to watch the TV oh. there. And in my family, I chose not to get a TV mm -hmm. until, well, we got one in 1974 when we were in Spain because uh, that was the year of the Olympics. Oh, right. And so uh, by then, our girls were older, and I felt, and then at the time, we just had two stations in Spain. I remember that. And they were controlled by the government, mm -hmm. and even the, the 1945 Westerns, they would sense... Uh, any kind of a questionable bar scene, they would censor that mm. out. Yeah. So you could watch anything that came on TV in mm. those years. So we bought one in 1974. I got our first TV. Huh. I remember it, we had, that was about the same time, the mid-70s, the, the first uh, video game, if you, it's not a video game, whatever it was, was a ping pong Ping thing. pong, <laughs> yeah. We played that by the hour. You know, I got that TV in 74. Our first color TV, you and Mimi gave it to us because you saw I wasn't going to break down and buy one. And in about 1990, y'all really? bought us a, oh my. bought us a, a it was still small. It was uh -huh. uh, probably the cheapest you could find, but <laughs> it was color in TV Spain? in Spain. Uh, yeah. Oh, uh, yeah. Uh, Okay, I have here something about plowing. You already mentioned that with the mules, but... Well, the farming, we did it. We did uh, most of the time when I was growing up, we did it. We plowed with mules. Uh, we didn't... Our farm wasn't a big farm, and and uh, to have the a tractor and all, you had to have a lot of acreage to really uh, cover the yeah, expenses sure, of a tractor. Sure. So uh, we plowed with mules, and uh, it was just... Uh, we used uh, 
it was a 10 inch mold board plow is one with the wings so it just sort of turned the dirt over hmm. and uh then eventually my dad did get a little tractor a john deere and it was strong enough to pull a two bottom plow hmm. they were 12 inch mold boards but the mules could just pull a, a 10 inch plow wow. but i would plow you could you know if we're gonna have an acre of cotton you know i it takes a long time I going doing betcha. those circles to plow it but uh but huh. I worked with that. So you plowed, you plowed in rows or in, you went around like that or what? How we did, went around and really? around to, to make it turn over smooth. You always go in the furrow that you've plowed and then take the one right beside it okay. and turn it over and keep turning, okay. turning it over. Okay. Uh, in fact, I was very, <laughs> with the mules and all, when I went to Bob Jones <laughs> in speech class, once we had to do a demonstrative speech and my, and we had to, explain something so i chose as my subject how to put the gears on a mule and <laughs> i was right fresh off of the farm and my teacher said uh she said i think you call that harness i said no ma'am where i come from them's gears <laughs> so i put a i drew a mule on the blackboard you know uh -huh. chalkboard and explain where the harness goes oh, yeah. and all the different things so yeah yeah, yeah. wow Okay, uh, what about the 200 pound bag? Okay, uh, we I already talked about the 500 pound bale. Yeah, well, my dad, of course, he would, if he had a little truck or something, he'd take, or the wagon, we usually used the wagon with mules, and we'd distribute the uh, sacks of fertilizer uh, before planting cotton. And uh, they came in 200 pound bags, but the way they were tied up on top, they had ears that you could get a hold of. Well, my dad would just put them on his back and carry them out. Uh, and uh, our Bronner would do the same thing. I remember the day that I finally got to where I could put a 200 pound bag, I had to get it off of the wagon, you know, uh -huh. and it would be waist high. Sure. Just a matter of leaning it over on my back. The right way. And but uh, but I was probably 14 or 15. Oh, wow. <laughs> and <laughs> maybe farm 15. Boys. And uh, I got to where I could handle it, carry a 200 bag. So you would carry it out to the field or what? Just to a certain place and drop it. Oh, okay. So that with a distributor uh, that, that distributed the, uh, we had two, two tools, two machines we used for planting cotton we had a we had the hopper that's what we had to plow the field get it ready then the hopper would put the seeds in mm -hmm. spread them out in every every 10 inches two or three cotton seeds and all but the distributor first we would go through and, and put fertilizer in the furrow I see. and then come by with a hopper and plant the cotton plant, yeah. and then you had to cover it or not yeah had to cover it then the hopper had wheels it would sort of cover it oh okay but uh, then we'd have to do some work. Some work. Uh huh. Okay. Uh, what were your shirts made out of? <laughs> well.